Coast FM's Celebrity Science, bringing you interviews with scientists, celebrities and special guests. Hello, good evening. Thank you very much indeed for joining me, Ben Makin, on tonight's episode of Celebrity Science here on Coast FM. Whoop! It's an exciting show, folks, and I know I always say that. I know I do, but this time it really is true. We have got the fabulous Helen Skelton on the show with us. She co-presented the BBC children's programme Blue Peter from 2008 until 2013, and since 2014 she's been a presenter on Country File, so a well-known face on television. She's been on some very exciting outdoor adventures, most recently up Ben Nevis, but you know what, most notably, I'm going to have to tell you actually, and we do talk a bit about this in our little interview coming up later this evening, she <sighs> kayaked the entire Amazon River, so quite quite a feat there. She's a fantastic woman, so looking forward to having Helen on the show with us. We're also going to be dipping our toes into the 70s. Yes, that's right. We've got fashion historian Amber Butchart on the show as well, as seen on BBC Breakfast. She's going to be talking a little bit about some fashion trends that people apparently just still in love with. So we're still in love with a bunch of things from the 70s still. Who knew? Well, let's face it, we all knew that. Bee Gees is one of them, isn't it? Staying alive, staying alive. Hoo, hoo. Yeah, I won't be singing that later. I will be playing the song, probably, but um, I think I'll leave the karaoke to, to you, actually, if it's safe for you to do so. Maybe join in. Anyway... Who else do we have? Well, we're going to be touching on some more sciencey stuff because it's called Celebrity Science, right? So I've got to try and, you know, shoehorn some science. I'm only joking. Got some science for you. Uh, we've got uh, Hugo Tagholm. Hugo is the chief executive of the Surface Against Sewage Charities. He's been talking about uh, pollution in the oceans. One of their current big focuses has, of course, been plastic pollution. He's been talking about beach cleans recently. He's been talking a little bit about that. Some local ones to us here in Penzance uh, and actually a bunch of surrounding areas. So there's tons of them going on at the moment down here in Cornwall. So Hugo is coming back to the show. And I say coming back because this is fantastic we've got him again we had him on the show last year and i'm really delighted to have him back because that means i didn't scare him away the first time so that's a plus isn't it whoop yeah personal victory there didn't scare away a guest excellent work ben excellent work we also have some filmmakers who have been out in africa filming elephants this is Mark Diebel and Victoria Stone. So this is pretty cool. We're going to be talking about some of the techniques that they've used to film some of the absolutely cracking shots in this new documentary film that they've put together. And actually they focus on this journey uh, of this family of elephants, this journey that they go through. It's a remarkable film, some remarkable images in there. And you know what? I'm going to have to tell you, just, just a little sneak peek into the interview a bit later. One of the techniques that they used was to, are you ready for this, deliberately stall an aircraft so they can effectively do a little dive in it just to get some good sweeping panoramic shots. So they really did put, you know, put their life right on the edge there. Also, I believe um, poor old Mark was basically locked in a, in a metal box right out in the plains to so he could get some shots of the elephants up close as well. So he went through he went through some pretty tough times, bless him, Mark did, to get this film done. So oh, I do urge you to watch it, if only because you know that he went through that suffering. So, you know, to make him feel a bit better about it. No, I'm only joking. It's a fantastic film. So we're talking to the filmmakers a bit later on. We also have and this is another returning guest, so wow, I really am. I've outdone myself this week, folks. This is Professor Howard Goodwin. He actually is currently, today, he's at the World Travel Market, so I had a call with him earlier uh, this morning, actually. I uh, had a quick chat about what they've been talking about at the World Travel Market, or the WTM, as the people in the know call it. So that's, that's me, obviously. Um, so he's been talking in particular about responsible tourism, which is a programme of interviews, panels and debates. Uh, now at actually four trade shows uh, at the World Travel Market, uh, market uh, basically involving a bunch of different shows one of them being in London which is where I've caught Harold today uh, and he's basically going to tell us a little bit about what that involves and what they've been talking about what his shows have been touching on obviously a lot of this is focused on the environment which comes absolutely no surprise at all I suppose now then we also have and Last week, I was very fortunate because I was joined live in the studio by Dr. Bethany Roberts. She's talking about her PhD topic, bumblebees. So a bit more on some environmental issues as well in that interview that you can uh, get involved with as well. There's some ways that you can help as well. So you can actually help bumblebees in your very own garden, believe it or not. Beth will be telling us all. Sorry, Dr. Roberts. 
will be telling us all. How dare I forget the doctor part? Uh, anyway, Beth, uh, I'm going to give you another inter- a chance to catch that interview uh, today in case you missed her coming on the radio live with me last week. Okay, folks. Right then, let's get started. There's not even enough time to play some Rod Stewart as a little intro song, so I don't know what the world's come to. Maybe I'll try and get him on a bit later. Don't you worry. Anyway, I want to kick off straight away this evening now with Helen Skelton. Now, she's talking today alongside David Rennick from the National Lottery Heritage Fund, talking about a particular project that's been funded by this uh, recently. It's uh, basically a youth uh, club, and they've actually been up Ben Nevis. We were talking about that, and indeed about some of Helen's uh, previous adventures, because she pretty much is a bit of a legend when it comes to the world of adventure, and of TV, obviously, because we know her from there too. Right, here we go then, people. Helen Skelton, David Rennick, please enjoy this. I am Helen Skelton. I work on lots of different teleprograms and write a couple of books and sometimes talk on the radio, but most of all, I like to be outside, preferably walking up big hills. Thanks, Helen. I'm David Rennick. I uh, work for the National Lottery Heritage Fund in the north of England, and I'm an ecologist by training, so all that wildlife stuff is sort of where I've come from. Oh, fantastic. Well, thank you very much, David, as well. Well, let's get chatting a bit about because I'm a couple of things I'm really keen to talk about. Of course, uh, about the funding that's been put being putting into the uh, the great outdoors, which is fantastic. And also, Helen, about some of your personal adventures because I know that you've been a uh, you know you've been an, an amazing adventurer really uh, over the years. Um, in particular, you know I, I'm gonna have to tell you actually that I think the coolest thing you've ever done is the kayak in the Amazon. That's still the coolest, I think. Amazing. Oh, bless you. Very kind. Thank you. Peak project as well today. But anyway, sorry, Helen. Tell us a bit about that adventure, if that's all right. So we went up Ben Nevis, the group of us, 10 young people from the Peak Project, which is a project in Glasgow that supports young people. It's, I don't want to say it's a youth club because that kind of makes you think about kids playing, you know, table football and stuff. Sure. This, the young people that I spoke to couldn't speak highly enough of the project at how it helped them, supported them, encouraged them to, to take on different things. And one of the things was coming up Ben Nevis with myself and a few other people. I'm not going to lie, the weather was brutal. Yes. It was definitely epic in many <laughs> senses of the word. Um, but I think, I mean, I think that's all part of it, you know. It was part of the adventure. There's no way those young people are ever going to climb a mountain and find it as hard as they did on that day unless they go to Everest or something. So I think they definitely jumped in at the deep end and they were brilliant. They were smiling, they were laughing, they saw, you know, how brilliant and ridiculous it all was and hopefully they've got a taste of the great outdoors and it's the first of many adventures to come. Oh, what an amazing experience for them, Helen. And you know what, Helen, I'm just thinking here, I bet you've got an epic theme tune, actually, for, for that experience. Maybe that could come in with the with the song request later. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Maybe theme tunes. I mean, I would say Hot Stepper, but it sounds a bit ironic. <laughs> yeah, Cold Stepper more. But yeah, I'll, I'll get it on. That's, that's, that's excellent. And David, it's yeah, great to have you as well with us today. Uh, I mean, you mentioned you're kind of ecologist by training, so it's um, you know kind of perfect synergy there. But why is the outdoors so special to yourself, David? Yeah, because I think landscape, um, it means something different to everybody. You know, I think uh, we all need that space and time to sort of get out there in the outdoors and in- enjoy ourselves, relax, uh, take a bit of time out. And I think, you know, the great outdoors is so good for, for, for well-being and for, 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 for us, for, for our everyday lives, really. And I think, you know, the National Lottery has, fund- has funded so many amazing projects that it's helping us to do that, helping us to enjoy uh, the great outdoors. That's fantastic. And I see as well, actually, that today we're putting together uh, a, a list of 25 amazing outdoor adventures that people can, can have. Actually, I've just seen, actually, there's a, a place very near my parents' house that I'd never actually noticed before. That's Tame Valley near Birmingham, because that's where my parents are living at the moment, actually. I'm going to have to check that out next time I'm back home, actually. <laughs> well, I think that's what's so great about this you know, collection of adventures. It's a real celebration. And like you say, it's great to hear you saying, oh, I didn't realise that was near me. That's kind of the point of this, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Just just celebrates what's out there for everyone to go and enjoy. And I think, wow, well, you know, stuck for something to do this weekend. Let's look up an amazing adventure. Let's do it. Come on, let's do it. (laughs) We know what you're doing this weekend. Yeah, exactly. You know it. You know, come rain or shine, I'm going to be in the Tame Valley. I can tell you that. (laughs) (laughs) So, Helen, am am I allowed to ask about your your kind of favourite past adventures in the great outdoors i mentioned the, the amazon which is particularly amazing i think but have you got any personal favorite trips that you've that you've done and favorite adventures uh, the amazon 
team was good because it was a real team effort, you know, we were, people always, I get a bit embarrassed when people say, oh, adventure, my job was always to make telly for kids to excite them about the great outdoors, and what was great about the Amazon was that there was, you know, the crew and myself, the small crew, cameraman and director and a doctor, living on a boat, and and we were just in the jungle for two and a half months, sort of never knowing where we'd camp each night, never knowing where we'd set off from each day, not really knowing what we were going to eat or where we were going to get it from. It was adventure in every sense of the word. And I think, you know, sometimes I maybe underestimated how, you know, many people bought into it and, and came along on, on the ride with us. And, and I feel really proud of that. And I love that <laughs> my husband's like, are you still dining out on that all these years later? <laughs> And I'm like, yeah, because sometimes people mention it to me, and I'm like, yeah, that's right, we did that. And I, I, I think that's what's great about adventure, and that's why I would encourage anybody to take on any challenge, you know, however relative it is. It doesn't have to be kayaking the Amazon. It might be having a paddleboard across a local lake. It might be doing a 5K run. It might be doing a two-mile walk. I think any challenge where you push yourself has huge, huge, huge rewards. You know, you, it's confidence, it's mental health, it's physical health. It's, there are so many benefits, and I think we hack back to this guide, but that's what this is about. It's a, it's a list. It's an opportunity for people to, to get stuck into something different and push themselves and challenge themselves. Yeah, that's a fantastic answer. Thank you very much, Helen. You know, I think, you know, following in your footsteps, people are going to say, all right, I'm going to reach all of these locations via bicycle or something like this, your, your South Pole adventure. Maybe they'll kayak it as well, which might be quite difficult for some of them. Maybe a kayak on wheels or something. I don't know. <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, anything's possible these days, isn't it? I yeah. mean, you know, I was looking at something, somebody kiting the other day and you can kite on buggies and you can, yeah. yeah. <laughs> The world of adventure definitely has no rules or regulations. So I think maybe that's what you could do. You could go through each of the 25 and get to each one by bike or walking on your hands. You've got, you're going to be busy, you. Yeah, I'm going to be very busy. You're going to see that I've broken multiple world records very soon, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's my bag. <laughs> yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> and David, do you do you have a personal favourite adventure that you've previously been on as well? Is that is that a bit hard to put yeah, on the spot I, like I this? Yeah, I really enjoy <laughs> um, I really enjoy swimming in the in the wild. So oh, um, nice. Just just this last summer, me and my family we went uh, off to Lincolnshire and went swimming uh, at Horsey Gap in Lincolnshire, and we swam with the seals. So oh. I think getting outside, getting wet, getting getting cold and swimming outside is really invigorating so uh yeah i'd recommend that to anybody oh it sounds wow. amazing sounds really cool I, I i think i've only done that only once before up in dartmoor which was absolutely um, it was such, such an amazing day one of my mates said i think we were, yeah we was back in back in uni in exeter and he said oh mate i tell you what something different today do you want to go uh, swimming in dartmoor and i thought what on earth do you mean by that i didn't know you could swim in dartmoor but yeah there we went went away swam in some rivers it was amazing best day ever. i'll have to put that one on my list <laughs> i haven't, haven't swam in dartmoor or so I'm in some of the other national parks and landscapes, but not that one, so yeah. Brilliant. Oh, amazing. I'm with you there. It's a, it's a fantastic experience. So, I, I mean, I think it's probably time, isn't it, David? I gave yourself a song request as well. And, and Helen, maybe you want to add another theme to the theme tune to the playlist? I don't know. What are you thinking, guys? Can I, can I get you a couple more tunes? <laughs> I, think, I think my 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 song, I've been uh, thinking hard while you've all been talking. <laughs> Louis Armstrong, What a Wonderful World. Oh, oh good. Yeah. I think, yeah. You know, it just sort of reflects the fact that the great outdoors, there are amazing things out there. Get out and see them. National Lottery are really proud to have funded a lot of them. And yeah, get out there and enjoy it, really. Oh, Good. Fitting. <laughs> Mine is less relevant. Blondie, Atomic, just because I love that song. Oh, yeah, quality. Well, we definitely have to get that on as well. <laughs> And people can get inspired listening to that, Helen, and they can think about what kind of challenge they're going to take on. That's what we're going to do, yeah? Going to get there inspired. you go, exactly. That's going to rev them up, hopefully. <laughs> well, thank you very much, both. In that case, uh, I'll just double-check that you're all happy uh, with everything asked. And also, if you wanted to add anything, you're welcome to. But otherwise, I'll let you go. What are you thinking? Just everything okay? No, that's all good. Okay. Yep, that's great. Thank Perfect. you very much. Well, thank you both. Thanks for coming on the show. I'll let you go then. No thank worries. You. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye coming up next in... Fans of Elephants Rejoice. This is all about the recent film, The Elephant Queen. Uh, this is an interview with the filmmakers, Mark Diebel and Victoria Stone. This is sort of a genre-crossing wildlife documentary because it focuses quite uniquely on a story and a character-driven narrative. They followed this family of elephants. So let me just read out a bit of the blurb so you know what's going on, and then we'll jump straight into this interview. So The Elephant Queen is Athena, a majestic elephant matriarch who leads her family across an unforgiving yet cinematic 
cinematic natural landscape made of grasslands and woodlands dotted with seasonal waterholes. The elephants share their home with the cast for supporting character species who provide texture and richness to the elephant's ecosystem from a toenail height perspective. Athena, as leader of her herd, anticipates the coming dry season and knows there are lean times ahead. As the water holds dry up, she has no choice but to take her family on a treacherous journey across even more foreboding landscapes as the majestic creatures seek refuge until the rains fall again. Pretty epic scenery associated with this film. I've looked at uh, a bunch of the stills. It really does look fantastic. And some of the techniques they used are a little bit scary, to be perfectly honest. So there's one in particular about uh, deliberately stalling an aircraft. I won't say any more about that. Uh, you know, I don't want to take the thunder away from, from the filmmakers. So let's get that interview on straight away, right away. And after this one, we'll be jumping into an in- to interview with uh, the CEO of Surfers Against Sewage with Hugo Tacorn, talking about some beach cleans that are going on in Cornwall right now. First of all, though, the Elephant Queen and the filmmakers behind the film. Hello, Ben. Hi, Ben. Hello, both. How, well, thank you very much for chatting to me today. Really, really pleased to have you on the show with us. You okay? Great, yeah. No, we're, we're, we're in good shape. Excellent, excellent. Well, you know what? I must uh, I must say actually straight away that um, I was actually really excited to see this, uh, this focus on elephants for your beautiful new film, The Elephant Queen, because I've only got to see elephants once um, uh, when I went to Kenya on a field course. I was very lucky to, to do that. And actually... And of course, you know, you guys know this already. You've been in, I know you've been in that area for, for many years doing this kind of work. But I must say it was so humbling to see them in their natural environment. I think it's such a fascinating creature to focus on in your, in your film. Yeah, I mean, it is amazing, isn't it? When you're, when you're with them, it, it just puts life into perspective. Yes, no, it, it absolutely does. And I think if it's OK with you both, just to start with, to, just to get talking about this, this film, I'd really like to focus on the fact that you've kind of gone with a... You, you're making a story, not just a documentary, but actually a story. And we're going to focus on, you know, this this family of elephants and, and they're going through these tough times. It's, that was a fantastic idea. I wonder if you could kind of tell us a little bit about how you kind of came about thinking about doing that. We filmed in, in East Africa for 30 years and elephants had always been so, somehow slightly tangential to, to our lives. And but every time we saw a little interaction, say, with of an elephant with a dung beetle or an elephant um, with a monkey or something, we'd we'd fire it away. And then what happened was we were filming in Amboseli National Park in 2009, 10, when there was a terrible drought. And it was seeing how the matriarchs cared for the families when they were absolutely desperate times that made us think, you know, there's a real story to be told here about the you know, the intelligence, the the empathy and the, the leadership of a, a family of elephants led by a charismatic matriarch. But at the same time, try and show their position in the you know, in the bigger picture in the ecosystem in a way but we wanted to do it through telling an emotional story I, th- I think for for us um having a story and having a story that sustains over an hour and a half the it's very important that it's that you engage in the characters that there's an intimacy there that you you almost watching it as if you're and thinking gosh the, these they're so like us and you 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 get sort of hooked in emotionally into their lives which in so many ways reflect ours and reflect that whole sort of circle of life between the big and the small and that one little action has an effect on the next that's fantastic and i believe as well it it, it take you eight years to make this film so this was no easy feat at all to get this produced wasn't it (laughs) no it it was entirely entirely independent i mean it started off literally with just vicky and i um and a couple of camp crew and a vehicle um, in the bush in East Africa. And gradually people people sort of attached themselves to it. We had a, a very long-term colleague, um, assistant director, Etienne O'Leaf, and he then joined us. And gradually, it's like a, a snowball in a way, because we started to get material. With people got excited about the story and, and became attached to it. But we were four years in Savo National Park filming every day, you know, apart from the, you know, the, the four or six weeks when we come back home to Cornwall. Oh, fantastic. And, and talking about the filming just for a second, because it, obviously these shots are absolutely remarkable. I think the one thing that um, audiences will immediately pick up on is the fact that you, you know, not only, of course, do you get the, you know, the majestic elephants, of course, you know, enormous animals, but also the kind of ground level interactions going on and the kind of smaller level. That must be quite a challenging thing to do. How, how do you kind of manage to get those both both those scales in there in the same shots sometimes? Okay, I'll tell you what you do. You 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 build a metal box which is just only just big enough to put 
um, in my case, your husband in um, <laughs> to put Mark in. You you squeeze in a camera and a tripod. Uh, you bury the box, but you don't you don't actually really bury it. You leave a metal lid exposed to the sun. And you make him stay in there for 12 hours a day. <laughs> you roast him. Um, I'm not quite sure what temperature until. And you hope he pops out with the result at the end of the day. But <laughs> seriously, what and is... when I don't, I mean, Vicky keep, keeps me in there. I mean, I spent... On one, on one time, I spent 30 days straight in this box. And I, I came out a different person. <laughs> We're making me out to be the devil here. But it's, it's actually a very equal joint job, this. But anyway, the, this box has a like a letterbox hole at the front of it. And it allowed it, us... We really wanted to tell the story of the little characters from down at their level so that we gave them stature so that we weren't just sort of, you know, if we'd stayed at our level, we'd be always looking down at them and they would be diminished in those characters. But we wanted to be right down at elephant toenail height and then at the same time, at other times, up with the elephants so that you really felt the film from the perspective of all the characters. And it was it, it was amazing being in that box because... I mean, the elephants knew I was there. They they could obviously smell me, and they'd come very close. But then, when I looked out of the box, I was looking literally straight up their trunks, and they were towering over me. So that anything that happened in front there um, gave this extraordinary perspective of of you know being right at toenail height, but that yet these giants were there, sort of drinking and and washing and and really sort of carrying on um, without 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 being. It wasn't that they weren't aware of me, but they were aware and still relaxed. maintaining that, that normal behaviour. So they were totally relaxed. Oh, that's fantastic. It does sound quite terrifying at times, though, Mark. <laughs> were there any kind of scary moments? Or you quite I mean, professional, the, so quite... I, I think it's more, more my mind than anything else. I was, because every morning, because this, this box had this sort of pillar, this um, letter box opening at the front, every morning I'd get in, it would be full of toads and frogs who had jumped in overnight look, looking for a safe place. So I'd have to bucket them out. And there'd regularly be 30 or 40 toads in there. But my one concern was that there were cobras around and cobras love toads and frogs. And, you know, a dark a dark place, a dark hole in the middle of the day, smelling of toads and frogs would be the perfect place. And I just thought, you know, if I get a cobra in here with me, as soon as they got inside the box, it would be trapped just like me. Neither of us would be able to get out. And I just, I just didn't want them to be in that position. No, no, I can see why. You might get some cool shots, Mark, but probably, you know. <laughs> but I think some of the, um, the some of the most dangerous moments are probably what we what we do when we're doing the aerials for the film because we did we did some with drone, but not not all of them by any means. And for example, the the dust storms or the the huge, um, you know, the the lightning storms. You're actually Mark is flying the plane to take the shots. So, so, so what I do is we 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 strap a, a camera, a digital camera, to the to a, a strut mount, and then I mean sometimes I'd have somebody with me. Um, oftentimes I'd be alone, and I'd fly up, and then essentially you know fly the shots with the plane. So if we wanted to do this like a reveal of a storm cloud coming, I get up there, I put the plane into a dive, you know, head for the ground, and then. See that see it on the monitor very gently. Then pull up um, until the storm waller went and the plane stalled and then sort of fell and then I'd recover and you know and we <laughs> I'd repeat that time and time again and, until I, until I got the shot. Mark, you're sounding more and more kind of like the Indiana Jones of nature documentaries here. I'm, I'm really impressed. I don't, I well, don't it, think he's so. Cornish. What else do you expect? <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, it, it's sounding absolutely fantastic, and and of course I do urge all of our listeners to check it out. It's actually um, debuting on Apple TV so people can check it, check it out the film. That's right. It's, it's had a, it's had a limited release um, in the UK and the, and the States. And the lovely thing is it goes out to a global audience tomorrow and we're thrilled about that. And also what it will do for elephants, because we need people to, to fall in love with elephants, you know, to really care about them and their, the predicament in, in which they're in. And this platform, you know, gives us potentially the, the ability to get this film in front of, you know, one and a half billion people. So we're, we're thrilled that Apple came on board. Oh, well, Mark and Victor, that's fantastic. Thank you. And I won't keep you too much longer now. I'm aware of your time. I was just wondering if it would be OK if I played um, Africa by Toto for you now. Is that, is that all right? <laughs> I think it would be fantastic. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. It's great speaking to you, Ben. <laughs> Thank you so much both. <laughs> Bye now. Bye, Bye now. Fantastic guests. Thank you very much for that. And, you know, I was, I was about to say great song request, but then I just remembered I forced you to have that song. So maybe I should have let you pick your own one. Anyway, you know, can't help that now. Can't help that now. It's in the past. 
Anyway, coming up next then, it's Hugo Tagholm, the CEO of the Surface Against Sewage Charity, a charity that deals with pollution in our oceans, in particular been focusing on plastic pollution in recent years. We had Hugo on the show a couple of years back actually talking about the Wasteland Warship, which was a campaign put on by Surface Against Sewage, essentially where they put they took loads of plastic waste that they collected on beach cleans and made an entire warship out of it, you know, literally a the size of a boat, out of just a tiny proportion of the waste that they got uh, during one of those beach cleans. So, uh, you know, quite a remarkable display of just the sheer amount of waste in oceans. Hugo is back now, as I said. So, Hugo, welcome back, sir. Absolute pleasure to have him uh, again on the show with us. Very well, welcome back to you, Hugo. I remember chatting to you back um, back when you had the Wasteland Warship on display. So, absolutely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It'd be great to uh, yeah to chat about the beach cleans that you've recently been yeah. conducting over at Surface Against Sewage. I wonder if you could yeah. just kind of tell us a bit about the initiative, really. Yeah, well, um, the Autumn Beach Clean Series is one of um, Surface Against Sewage's um, sort of flagship beach clean um uh, events uh, happens every year it has been for a number of years now and it's one of the key moments that communities get together um, to uh, to tackle plastic pollution on their beaches to monitor and assess what they're finding and to collect those results to help us influence changes within business and uh, with of course government policy um, so we can try and stop the tide of plastic um, washing up on beaches right around the UK and further afield now we're we're um, we're really proud to have such a huge army of volunteers out there, um, some 100,000 people every year, and the beach cleans in, in the autumn time you know, tend to attract about 30,000 people who contribute almost 100,000 hours of, of time to uh, you know, protecting these unique assets um, that everyone loves. I think we're in this island nation where where the beach is, uh, is an iconic um, environment that, that everyone really shares a passion for. No, oh, that's fantastic. And, and some results coming back from uh, your, 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 your research into the brands, actually, that you're coming across most of. That might be super useful as well, you know, not only for the businesses, of course, but also for perhaps people to think a bit about, you know, where they're falling behind, perhaps on their single use plastics. I don't know if you've got any insights there. Yeah, well, the, the, the brand audit um, is something that we do in our spring cleans. Um, and with the autumn clean, we're now undertaking a new sort of materials audit to, to really establish, you know, the, the different, you know, composition of materials we're sure. finding at the beach. But the brand audit is a really good one. Um, and it, it stemmed out of a, an initiative we had um, a few years ago called Return to Offender, which found, uh, sort of identified a branded litter on the beach and sent it back to the companies responsible for manufacturing that plastic um, and it was very successful, got a lot of engagement with the big multinationals. And people really like understanding the, the, the types of brands that they find most of at the beachfront. And these brands have it within their power to change their packaging, to change their products, to manufacture in a different um, way, to create much more effective domestic recycling systems and all sorts of initiatives that can really um, stop plastic from ending up in our ocean or on our beaches. And so they're very useful tools to apply that pressure to those uh, you know, huge multinational corporations that really pump out a, a massive amount of plastic every year and to question what they're doing and to look at how they can give us an alternative way of living plastic free. And of course, Hugo, this time of year coming up towards Christmas now, is this particularly bad for plastics? I can kind of picture it being really, really quite, you know, people buying a lot of single use plastics and, and almost almost getting in that kind of, you know, festive spirit, I suppose, and, and perhaps not being as careful as they should be. Is that do you find that at all? Indeed, I think we we um, we all know. I don't need to sort of uh, tell your listeners um, that, that, of course, Christmas time is is dominated by a consumer agenda yeah, these days. Yes. Um, we are consuming more than ever, and of course, single use plastics make up um, you know a, a bigger and bigger proportion of that. Um, and Christmas time, we'll see the the type of potentially useless products that that. Um, people put into their, their, their shopping baskets, um, the sort of stuff we can see piled up at shop tills that you might use once and might be amusing on Christmas Day if somebody opens it but then cast aside and never used again to make its way slowly but surely towards landfill or worse still to the ocean or the environment. And so people really should think about their their ability to, to minimise their plastic footprint at this time of year without getting in the way of the, the incredible fun um, and sort of um, cohesive nature of, of, of Christmas time and this festive period. 
So, so yeah, I think everyone can question just how much they're consuming, what they're consuming, the sort of value of the products that they they have, and how long they'll have them for, and really just just question um, each purchase uh, appropriately. And it's great because people who are living in Penzance will be hearing this going out on Coast FM and also in Falmouth on Source FM. And actually both of these sites I can see straight away online on your website, actually, there are a number of beach cleans in the area. So if people want to get involved yeah. and, and hopefully actually make, you know, not only reduce their impact this Christmas, perhaps even make a positive one and go along to one of these cleans. I think that would be fantastic. Well, that, uh, absolutely. Now, now, Belmont and Penzance are two of our sort of leading plastic-free communities where community, businesses, schools, uh, biz, uh, you know, business leaders, uh, politicians all get together to try and tackle uh, the issue of single-use plastic in those communities. And, and they, they, they do all sorts of things um, that can... Um, that that people can take part in, whether it's you know refill, you know refill movements, whether it's beach cleans, uh, whether it's suppliers and shops that are doing things differently and offering um, packaging free options. So all of these types of things. Um, but all of our beaches start, at, uh, all of our, our sort of beach cleans are the sort of start of of the journey for people. So people coming along. along up and monitoring plastic pollution at the beach is a brilliant place to, to, to get to know like-minded um, people, to uh, take direct radical action and to actually challenge the plastic economy that we live within at the moment. Well, Hugo, thank you very much. I wonder if, as well if we could point listeners in the direction of more information. I suppose a fantastic uh, resource would be your website at Surfers Against Sewage. <laughs> Yeah, people can, of course, they can find us through Google or they can go to saf.org.uk. They can sign up for Beach Cleans. They can become a member. They can take part in fundraising events. Um, well, I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our volunteers and all of our supporters around Cornwall, around the country and around the world who help us create real change for our oceans. Thank you, Hugo. One last thing, then I will let you go, and that is very simply and perhaps a bit silly, so you have to excuse me, but a song request, Hugo. Could I interest you at all in a little song to uh, to say thank you for coming on the show? I don't know first. Is that too silly? What do you think? <laughs> no, I mean, uh, a, a song request. Now, you, you've really, you've really, put, really on, the put spot, me on the spot, haven't I? Um, oh, sorry. Because um, uh, I am, I am a, 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 a big Foo Fighters fan, so if there's anything you can put on by them, of course. Then, then that would be great. Oh, nice. Well, I love it, Hugo. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Um, and I'll let you go, no but thank you for coming on the show. Thanks very much. Bye now. See ya. Bye. <laughs> Hugo, what a fantastic request there. Now, still on the show, still to come, we've got loads more special guests. Next up, we've got a fashion historian. He's going to be talking a little bit about the 70s and the, tr- the, the, the trends from the 70s that people are still in love with, which, uh, you know, I can't blame you at all. So, obviously, we're going to have to play some of, the, some of the BGs there. So, you know, that might come as good news or bad news to you. I'm not quite sure. But anyway, it's coming. It's coming. We've also got Professor Harold Goodwin. Today, he's at the World Travel Market. He's talking about responsible tourism. So more on that a bit later. And we've also got another chance to hear Dr. Bethany Roberts, who joined me last week live in the studio, talk about her PhD topic, which focused on bumblebees. So a load more to come. So please don't get anywhere. Uh, we're going to take a short musical break now to delve into some One Direction. Then we've got a short break uh, for the news, and then we're going to carry on with the show. So, please, people, don't you dare go anywhere now. Stay with me, people. Just stay with me. (laughs) Welcome back, people. Yes, I'm still here. I'm still in the studio. I'm so sorry to disappoint you. But, yes, it's me, Ben Maker. Now, if you just tuned in, we've got loads of special guests on the show with us this evening. Still to come, we are going to be delving into the 70s. We've got 70s fashion historian Amber Butchart on the show. She's actually been on BBC Breakfast and a bunch of TV shows and documentaries over the years. So it's a right pleasure to have Amber with us on the show this evening here on Coast. We're going to be playing a bunch of tunes. Some obvious songs are going to have to come up now, aren't they? Bit of the Bee Gees, for example. So I don't know if you're a fan of that kind of music. You know, we're going back to the 70s, so love it or hate it, I don't know. But it's coming on, so I, maybe I should be apologising to you. I'm not sure. After that, we've got Professor Harold Goodwin. Today he's at the WTN, the World Travel Market, talking about sustainable tourism more about that a bit later we're explaining all about that what that means and what they've been talking about and indeed what this program actually is and what it's trying to accomplish 
All of that is coming up. We've also got another chance to hear uh, Dr. Bethany Roberts talking about her PhD topic, Bumblebees. So a bit more on environmental issues there for you and also ways that you can get involved and help. So that's uh, quite nice synergy today, I think, with some of the interviews that we've had previously, like Hugo Tacholm, the chief executive of Surface Against Sewage, who was talking about ways that we can get involved and essentially do beach cleans at the moment is their, is their focus at the moment at the charity um, here in Cornwall to help clean up the uh, the ocean. Right then, let's get kicked off, shall we? The second half of the show. Woo, it's exciting. Right, um, I think we're going to start. We're going to have to start, aren't we, with the, with, um, se- with the 70s. We're going to have to go there right now, aren't we? Uh, enough chat from me. Let's just go right there. We're in there. It's the 70s again. Oh, wow, look at that. Wow. Look at the BGs. They're walking about. Oh, wow, this is cool. Uh, yes, get on. Just say the two-thirds of us here in Britain still really, really love 70s fashion trends. So what we're seeing especially is Sarah Fawcett really topping these poles of a sort of style icon of 70s TV. So this kind of, you know, she's got a very classic but glamorous girl next door look. We've got the denim flares, we've got the retro sportswear. These are the looks that people are still absolutely loving today and hoping to recreate. And Amber, as a, as a fashion historian, what kind of, what is it about, because it, people always kind of talk about the 70s and the style associated with the 70s. What is it about it that captivates so many people, I guess, I'm trying to ask? Well, I think the 70s is a really... We've got such a broad range of styles here. We've got not only these kind of Charlie's Angels looks, but we've got disco fever going on with, you know, groups like the Bee Gees, styles yes. like Saturday Night Fever. And we've also got styles like punk emerging on the streets of, you know, places like London and New York in the mid-1970s. So there really is something for everyone here. I think, I think you know, I'm going to have to say we are going to have to get some 70s tunes on after this interview, aren't we, really? It's only fair. I think you definitely <laughs> are, <laughs> yes. Have yes. you got some personal favourites, Samba, that we're going to have to play after this? What do you think? <laughs> well, I think the, the, 70, the Saturday Night Fever soundtrack is just full of absolute bangers, so I think you should definitely go with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, well, I'll make sure I will do that after after we close up. That's coming straight on. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, but then it's also, it's not just the clothes that we're seeing as well. It's also people's hairstyles. Over a quarter of women have, are saying that they've rocked the Farrah Fawcett hairstyle, this very iconic hairstyle. So we're really seeing it sort of filtering into all areas of people's style and appearance. Yeah, you know what, I actually, um, I actually Googled this this morning and I think it was only a couple of days ago that someone had just uh, just put up on YouTube a, a tutorial on how to do that hairstyle. So it's clearly, a, you know, clearly still popular. People are still trying to do it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I hope to see you rocking it. So oh, I've seen then. <laughs> you know, I wish I could. Unfortunately, my hair's a little bit thin for that, but uh, I'll try it. I'll still try it, maybe. What, what I've got left? <laughs> <laughs> Great. I think they might I think they might laugh me out of the barbers if I go in saying that that's my uh, that's my goal. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> I'll give it a try. I'll give it a try. Anyway, if, we, if we've got something like the Bee Gees on or, or the soundtrack, then we'll be fine because you know it doesn't really matter, does it? You'll still be feeling absolutely fabulous. So that's what I'm going to think. <laughs> exactly, exactly, yeah. And this is also a great way to really bring some sort of sustainable style into your wardrobe as well. I'd really encourage people to shop for the original pieces. Go to your local charity shops, secondhand markets, vintage stores, or you can raid your own wardrobe uh, or, you know, the wardrobe of other people who still maybe have 70s pieces in their wardrobes. We're looking at things like shirt dresses, boiler suits, jumpsuits, and of course, those classic denim flares. So you don't have to go to the high street for this. You can shop for originals. I think that's a really nice point, actually. A particularly good point about, um, you know, if you do do fancy getting yourself something, you then pop to a charity shop. That's a brilliant point. Thanks for that, Amber. You're welcome. So, Amber, the final question for you then, if that's okay, is do you have a person... And this this might be too hard to choose or, you know, a bit of a daft question again, I'm afraid, but um, do you have a personal favourite piece of... You know, could it be, could be a piece of clothing or just a style, a hairstyle, whatever it is. Piece of favourite style from the 70s. What's your personal favourite if you had to just pick one? You said there's kind of a bunch going on, so... Yeah, well, a personal favourite. I actually have an old Bieber dress of my mother's from the early 70s. Oh, um, cool. Bieber, sort of very well-remembered, well-loved brand from the late 60s and early 70s. That, to me, would be an absolute favourite. But I particularly also, I love the sort of the action, the practice, nature of a lot of the Farrah Fawcett, you know, Jill Munro styles. There's a great image of her on a skateboard in trainers and flares and she just looks so dynamic. It's fantastic. 
And the cool thing is actually, is I've just just remembered actually, it must be next year. Uh, but uh, Charlie's Angels is returning actually as a film, isn't it? So that's cool. It is indeed. So we're likely to see a you know sort of whole host, you know, a whole new generation in, uh, introduced to the original TV show as well. Brilliant. Well, thanks for your time. I'm about to let you go then. And uh, yeah, guess what? We've got a wicked playlist coming up now, thanks to you. <laughs> oh, fantastic! I look forward to hearing it. Thanks yeah. very much, Ben. <laughs> thanks, Amber. Bye now. Bye bye. <laughs> Coming up next then, it's Professor Harold Goodwin. Chatted to Harold today. He's at the World Travel Market talking all about sustainable uh, tourism. So let's get him on the show. He's going to tell us a bit about what he's been talking about recently, what they identified at uh, this year's uh, World Travel Market, and all of the things you need to know, basically, to understand this interview. Let's get the man on. Let's get him on. He's got an amazing song request as well, by the way. This is something that I'd never personally heard before, and I really enjoyed it, so I hope you will as well. Anyway... Here is the man himself, Professor Harold Goodwin. Thank you very much for coming back on the show. Actually, I had a pleasure to a uh, pleasure to invite you back. Had you on last year, so welcome back. How are you doing, Harold? You okay? <laughs> oh, very well. We've had a very good show. Excellent. Well, that's good to know. Um, I would love to um, really just invite you to discuss a little bit about. Um, well, really remind our listeners on the Responsible Tourism Program and its key aims and objectives, but also. Maybe just update our listeners on how this current show, as you say, it sounds like it's gone well. I wonder if you could kind of tell us some of the key things you've been discussing this time, this year. I'm here at WGM London at Excel, and it's World Responsible Tourism Day today. And clearly, in the context of the two existential threats that, that face our species, we focused, yes, focused yesterday on biodiversity loss. Today, we're focusing on carbon. So we have two sessions, one looking at the decarbonisation of the travel and tourism industry, with everybody from the travel agents through to the airlines represented on that panel. And then this afternoon, we're dealing with the Achilles heel of travel and tourism, which is the carbon impact of people flying around the world. So we've got two very um, controversial panels, both being um, led by Tanya Beckett from the BBC. And I'm optimistic about that. But in terms of what's happened at the show, we had sessions on child protection, looking at what happens when you stop going to orphanages. We've been looking at um, plastics and how they can be removed. And it's interesting to see how much progress there's been in the last year on plastic removal, largely, I think, because of the Attenborough effect with Blue Planet. So it's, it's been exciting. We've been all over the agenda of responsible tourism. And we are getting much bigger audiences this year than we had last year. It, there's been a kind of sea change in people's attitudes which I think has been generated by both the, the school strikes and the Extinction Rebellion movement, which has globally affected the way people are understanding their responsibility. One of the things which some of the industry speakers are saying, and this is something I've said to my students for years, is that people talk about the industry and companies forgetting that they're run by individuals. So more and more of the high-level speakers that I get to speak on the panel are saying things like, my daughter's been educating me. Yes. You know, she's, she's been showing me how to recycle. She's been talking to me about the fact that I fly too much. And I think that effect is now coming through. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the Extinction Rebellion, you look at those photographs of the people involved, and quite a lot of them are grey-haired. Yes. And there is that sense that, there's, that people are realising they have a responsibility about what they leave for the next generation. And I think that's part of what's driving the change. It's not just the kind of campaigning that I do. That's fantastic. And, and, and Harold, is there anything um, I'd like to just uh, you know, touch on a couple of points? I know these, uh, these sure. might be fairly obvious, but uh, I'd, I'd just like to get them across for listeners, really. And that is, is, you know, is there anything particularly obvious that they can do, you know, perhaps if they have holidays booked and they're looking forward to travelling soon, or if they travel on business, of course, as well? Are, is there anything obvious they can do to actually you know, impact the environment a little bit less, you know, whether that be talk to the right people about what they're doing or whether it be, you know, specific things they can actually do whilst whilst away. You know, have you got any tips for those people? I, th I think there are some, some very simple things that if people keep them in the front of their minds, they will do the right thing. On flying, the critical thing is if you can, don't fly. Go by rail if you can. It's unfortunate that that will often be more expensive. We need to encourage government to level the playing field so that rail and airlines can compete on a more level playing field. But if you are going to fly, fly direct, fly in economy, fly on planes that don't have first class because then the amount of carbon to take you across the Atlantic or down to the south of Europe will be less per seat because more people are on the plane. So flying on a budget airline or a charter is going to be better than flying scheduled. 
On um, a waste, the important thing is always to bring your batteries home so that they go into recycling in the UK. Don't take them with, with you and leave them in a country which is unable to recycle the heavy metals in batteries. Don't take the packing with you. If you've got lots of plastic on new clothes or a new swimming costume, unpack it and take it without the packaging because we will recycle it better here than in many destinations around the world. And socially, just travel with a bit of respect. Travel with an open mind wanting to learn about the place and try to think what you would feel like if somebody did to you what you are about to do there. So I live in a small town in Kent. We get tourists who come and poke their, their cameras into the windows of the old houses in which some of our residents live. And we don't like that. So mm. if you're abroad, don't do it to other people. If you wouldn't do it at home, don't do it abroad. It's yeah. a very simple way of thinking about how you might travel with respect. Okay. You were one of the people who asked me last year, you said at the end of the interview, where could our listeners go to get more information? Yes, absolutely. And we, I, that we do now have a website you can go to. So can I just give you that please website do, address? Please do, yeah, absolutely. It's responsible tourism, all one word, dot WTM dot com backslash discover. There's a whole lot of material on the responsible tourism there, but there's one set which is on how to travel responsible. Oh, perfect. Travel responsibly. That's ideal. Because I was, was going to say, actually, you, you predicted my next question, so that's fantastic. And you know what, Howard? I think last time. I'm not actually sure I got round to giving you a song request, which is very, very naughty of me, because I like to give my guests song requests as well. Or is that too silly? I, I don't know if it's a bit daft. <laughs> no, I'd love, I'd love you to play something from the Soweto um, String Quartet. Okay, perfect. I, sh- I shall. Thank you, Harold. Anything you like from them. Okay, brilliant. It, 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 it's traditional concert chamber music, but with an African beat. It's amazing. Your listeners will love it. <laughs> Well, thank you very much again to Professor Harold Goodwin. It was a pleasure to have you back on the show, Harold. And I'm always delighted to have uh, returning guests. It really is amazing to have you back on the show. So thank you. And you know what? You're always welcome, Harold. So if you want to pop on again, oh, well, you're just so welcome to. Right, coming towards the the end of the show, just the last half hour now. Uh, and now I'd really like to, uh, I promise you this at the beginning of the, of the uh, show, so I'm sorry I had to wait so long for this, but now I'd like to give you another chance to listen to Dr. Bethany Roberts. She joined me live on air last week talking about her PhD topic, bumblebees, and a bit about how you can help uh, bumblebees actually in your in your very back gardens. So that's really useful to know. So let's get her back on the show now. I've got some song requests as well. Beth has got a pretty epic taste in music, luckily, so she chose a great tune, so you'd be pleased to know that. So you'll get a, just a short break from, uh, from my own choices, but uh, don't worry. I'll be back straight after this with a few more songs to close the show up with. So, yeah, yeah you can see you sighing, you know, breath of a... Yeah, just a bit of relief there. Anyway, let's get Beth back on the show. Hope you enjoy this, guys. And straight after this, as I said, we will begin to be closing the show up. So, Beth... My last guest for the day. Thank you very much again for joining me on the radio, Beth. Okay, then, as promised, it's time to welcome our guest. It's Dr. Bethany Roberts. Beth, how are you doing? You okay? I'm very well this morning, Ben. Very happy to be here. <laughs> Good. I, you, I can't believe that I finally got you in here, Ben. It's taken <laughs> two, two years, three years? Yeah, Possibly probably. Longer. I don't know why I haven't been here sooner. <laughs> Well, as soon as you walked in, I saw the, the beam on your face. You thought, <laughs> well, wow. exactly. It's like I've stepped <laughs> into heaven. Yeah, well, exactly. And you know what? We've got some songs lined up for you, Beth, but I'm sure you, you're probably going to add to the playlist as well. I don't know. We'll see. Well, hopefully. <laughs> well, let's talk a bit about bumblebees to start with then. My favourite subject. Um, and of course you are, you know, we're going to be mentioning some music, I believe, as well at some point. A barbershop quartet? Somewhere? Yeah, yeah. So I'm yeah. part of a barbershop quartet. I'll tell you all about it later. Excellent. Well, we're going to come on to that as well then. That's perfect. Even better when we have a musical guest as well. <laughs> oh, hang on, what's that? Oh, I'm just getting a text from the boss, actually. He's saying, make sure you get to do a live performance. Is, is that oh, all right? that's convenient. Yeah, How yeah, convenient, just got... yeah. <laughs> He's listening in. Anyway, Beth, yeah, let's talk a bit about um, your PhD work. Of course, it's, um, I don't know, does it feel like that's a long way in the past now? I kind of moved on with that. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it was forever ago and only yesterday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Still haunts you a bit, probably. Still wake up in the middle of the night, yeah, <laughs> thinking about p-values. and. <laughs> I've got the Viber coming up, so tell me, how scary is it? I actually really enjoyed it. Okay, I know... but that's probably because you're really good, so... <laughs> no, I hated everyone who used to tell me that a Viber was enjoyable. I thought, you know, you're stuffed in a room with two experts 
I cannot think of anything worse. But if, you know, if your supervisor's chosen a nice person, it's like a really informal, lovely chat okay. about all the things that you're passionate about. I know how much you love your... I suppose on paper that does sound kind of ideal, doesn't it? So it should be. Exactly, should be, okay. exactly. You'll smash it, just like you do everything. <laughs> well, thank fine. you. Very, very kind, very kind. But uh, just enough about me, Beth. It's time to talk about your work. So, yeah, just give our, just give our listeners a bit of a broad overview if that's right i mean bumblebees is the focus essentially wasn't it yep so i've just done my phd on bumblebees and specifically looking at their nesting ecology so i was lucky enough to work in a number of the beautiful gardens we have here in cornwall so trabar trelissic heligan bosphorthic um so that was absolutely amazing and i was trying to look at do how do bumblebees use these cornish gardens throughout the year for nesting, for foraging, and compare that to our farmland. Right, oh, that's fantastic. And uh, you know, the great thing about that is you've def- you definitely chose the right thing there because some- when some people say, oh, they're doing field work, it's somewhere terrifying, isn't it? You just think, oh, I'm just going to <laughs> It's probably still a bit unpleasant when it's bad weather and stuff, but... I think probably the most annoying thing is that you don't always get to enjoy the garden. So, yeah, yes, yeah, you're in these course. beautiful gardens. The sun is shining. But actually, you know, I've got 10 minutes to do this. Yeah, I haven't got time, God damn it. And people want to come and talk to you, which I absolutely <laughs> love because everyone loves bumblebees. Oh, it's a doing? great subject. And I'm there like, I really want to talk to you. But oh, I've got eight more minutes and I need yeah, to have this, as many this bees. This isn't an outreach <laughs> schedule. I've got that scheduled in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's because it's one of those things. Everyone, I think everyone kind of roughly appreciates that bees are super important but i wonder if you could kind of outline a bit about that it's just for people to listen yeah listen so i think we've made really big progress so it wasn't actually that long ago where we only really thought about honeybees right. um obviously there's only one species of honeybee but they do produce all of our kind of commercial honey um so and they do a lot of pollination so we've always been big on those but now we're starting to realize that there are other bees so there are bumblebees which i focused on we have 25 species of those in the uk And there are also solitary bees, so they're really small and they are important, especially for apple blossoms. They're um, one of the key pollinators of apples. And there's almost 250 species of those in the UK. So really, our other bees are absolutely crucial for pollination, not just for crops, but for our garden plants, which we love. That's crazy, actually. I mean, I'm going to have to admit that I was kind of one of the... I'd probably put myself in that category of thinking, oh, I know about bees, honeybees. Yeah, who doesn't know about honeybees? But actually, yeah, I mean, that's just one of the numerous species. Yeah, exactly. And obviously, because we keep them in hives, we know a lot about them. Yeah. But actually, our wild bees are super important. And so something that people don't know is that bumblebees in particular often like to nest underground. So in old rodent burrows, uh, in cracks in walls. Probably you've noticed them sometimes in the loft installation in your house, which you might not be pleased about, but (laughs) they move out after only a few weeks. So if you find a nest in your garden, actually, I'd really encourage you just to leave it there because they're probably not going to sting you. They're really docile. They'll just fly by you. And at the end of the summer, they'll leave and they probably won't come back to the same place the next year. So you don't have to kind of um, be scared of them. I'd encourage you to just love them and leave them be and plant some nice plants. Sounds like you should be honoured. It's just, you know, you just be hotel for the night. It's quite an honour, I think. Exactly. I think, Welcome yeah. It's, anytime I find a wild bumblebee nest, I'm absolutely over the moon. It's such a special thing. And is there, because sometimes you hear about this, uh, is there anything that people can do to kind of encourage that in their gardens? Because you sometimes hear about people rewilding their gardens, don't you? I don't know if this is a thing which... Yeah, so I think we really, because we're used to seeing, you know, very mown, clean lawns, we think that that is the kind of ideal look that we should go for with our gardens. But actually, just let it go wild. Even if you just let a patch of it grow wild, the long grass, the different plants that come in there make really good habitats, not just for bees, but for other insects, for mice, um, for birds. And there are other things that you can do so you can plant things. So I think that's really the biggest thing that we can do to help our bees is just to get planting. So in the spring, it's really important to have early flowering plants. So willows, pyrus, borage, but then things coming into the late autumn. So if you've got a wild area, brambles are absolutely incredible. All bees love brambles and you can snip your bramble branches and then solitary bees will actually nest in the ends of those so oh, lovely there we go good for feeding and good for homes yeah there we go well that's some nice advice you know I, th- I think i'm kind of even though i would do it anyway obviously i think i've kind of accidentally rewilded my garden just by <laughs> not paying any attention whatsoever and that's what we want we need more lazy gardeners that's who it. just can't be bothered 
perfect for wildlife. Just let, <laughs> let nature take its course. Just and and now you have an excuse because yeah, it's, it's not just that you're lazy and you can't be bothered. You are just love nature and you're passionate about nature. Well, exactly. And you're giving nature a home. Do you know, my, uh, my dad came down last week. Actually, he's actually coming down this weekend as well. And he said, you know, that better be cut. The grass better be cut by the time I come back. But I'm going to say no. Well, I had Beth on the show. And she was telling me, actually, I really shouldn't be doing that. Exactly, so. exactly. You've, You've heard it from me. Dr. Roberts now. <laughs> exactly. She's officially exactly. a doctor. She knows <laughs> these things. Have you got the T-shirt that says, trust me, I'm a doctor yet? Not yet, but... We're going to have to get you one. We're going to have to get one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're going we're gonna to have to come on some, to some theme tunes shortly, but I think what might be really nice as well, um, Dr. Roberts, I'm going to call you that, for now, <laughs> um, would be, have you got any places that we could point listeners to I don't know, online, so I don't know if you have any kind of Twitter groups going and things like this, and obviously if you don't have the links to hand, that's fine, we'll pop them on the Facebook page and stuff, but places people can look up a bit about bees, that kind of thing? Yep, so there's Blooms for Bees, which has loads of information about plants that you can um, plant for bees. The Royal Horticultural Society actually does um, mark plants with if they're pollinator-friendly, you do have to be a bit careful because some companies will still use chemicals, so it's worth right. your research about those when you're buying garden plants. Try and find chemical-free ones. Also, we've got the Bumblebee Conservation Trust and just general charities like Bug Life, are an amazing UK organisation working for all insects and invertebrates across the UK. And so those are the kind of people that you should be looking out for for your insect and bee knowledge. Oh, fantastic stuff. Well, um, Beth, I mean, what do you want to do? Do you want to, t- do you want to take a musical break? What are you mm. thinking? Would you like to do that? We could take yet. a musical I mean, break. It's up, to, it's up to you. We can do. Because, you know, I was going to ask you another question, but I don't. Uh, this might be a bit mean, because I just wanted to know. Right, just, so imagine right now, okay, everyone's just intently listening, and you think, all right, here's my chance. Three things that you wish people knew about bees. Okay, so <laughs> bumblebees don't produce honey. Okay. They... Well, Live underground, most people don't know that. And also that bumblebees are social, so they do live in a group, they don't live on their own. Well, you've disappointed me there, Beth. I was hoping that would be a really difficult question. <laughs> I'm a <Get> bee <laughs> expert, Ben. I have to know these things. Yeah, you know, you, you're, you're prepared. Well done, Beth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I did choose you this song, Beth. Um, I couldn't, basically, I wanted a song specific with bees in it. Unfortunately, the only thing I could find was this. Just give this a little listen. Just ignore that bit, it's the intro. <laughs> Just give this a little listen. This isn't the kind of thing that I wanted, but... You liking it so far? I love it, and I can see it. The listeners at home can't <laughs> see that, but... There you go. Bees go buzzing one by one. No, so I won't insult you by playing that one. Maybe you'll come out with something different. Anyway, let's talk about some music, Beth. You were talking about the Barbershop Quartet as well. Yeah, so I'm part of a... Well, actually, I did say we were a quartet. That is a lie. There are more than four of us. I'm sorry. <laughs> but we're a barbershop chorus, which is... So barbershop is a specific kind of music. It's four-part harmonies. And we've got an amazing evening of music coming up on the 9th of November at half seven in Tremaine Hall in Myler. And it features some other amazing groups. So we've got the Hit and Miss Quartet joining us. And we've got Paul Levin Band, Octet and Quintet, which is amazing. And tickets are £6 in advance. You can get them from Myla stores. Or they're available on the door for 7 50 or £4 for children. But also come and find us on Facebook, Celtic Chords, and then you might be able to work out how to get tickets from us there. Mm, so amazing. It's going to be incredible. Yeah, well, I definitely urge everyone to check that, that one out then. Uh, so, you know, not only a, a lady of science, Beth, but of music as well. It's impressive. I like it. <laughs> and now you come into, this, into the studio, so also a lady of radio now as well. Well, it's some, yeah. It's good stuff, isn't it? Many talents. <laughs> <laughs> right, come on then. Let's, let's work out a song. What, what are you thinking? I mean, I've got, I've got a little playlist because I, I put one together just thinking, all right, I'm just going to put some classics in there. Yeah. And I was thinking maybe you might want to add to it. I don't know what you think. So we could start with one here, right? Should we start with one of yours? We can work out because what's I'm intrigued next. to right? find out what you thought would be appropriate for me. Well, the thing is, I am a man who, hopefully, as you know, a, a fabulous taste in music. Fabulous, absolutely fabulous Impeccable. taste in music. Impeccable. Yeah, exactly. So one of the things which I thought was really good. Um, so you might know that I'm a massive fan of Rod Stewart. Well, have I you hadn't heard this, hadn't heard that. Ben, have actually. you heard this remix? Oh wow. I cannot wait to hear this remix. Yeah, well, there we go. So I was hoping you'd like this. So let's get this bad boy on. And then, then you can have you, your actual song for a second. Is that all right? <laughs> go for it. All right, let's, let's get the song. Oh, there we go then, Beth. How amazing was that tune? 
life changing. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? Well, you have actually got another song for us, but before that, we have received some um, some questions. Oh. We'll put these to you now, if that's okay. So, just like uh, the five all over again. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Mr. Ben Toulson has messaged in, and he says very simply, um, Beth, why are you so mean about badgers? So would you care to explain this? What was it? It's not. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> so upset. I love badgers. <laughs> I did do a couple of my PhD chapters were looking at the effects of badger predation on bumblebee nests because we do know that badgers do like to dig up wasps' nests, which people probably will be very happy about because people are unreasonably nasty about wasps. But they also like to dig up bumblebee nests. But I think the fact that badgers and bumblebees have coexisted for quite a long time probably means that they're absolutely fine. They're still living in harmony <laughs> i don't endorse any mean things to badgers yeah well that, that's a very very well thought out response beth very very good there excellent you can't be caught out can you that was probably supposed to do that but it didn't work and this next question isn't very isn't very sciencey at all really but it's just very simply why don't you come to lunch anymore uh Truro's not that far away <laughs> I'm sorry, I will start commuting from Truro to Falmouth every lunchtime. Or, I mean, if it's not that far away, why don't you come to lunch with me? Take that a little, is, take a little legal, Falmouth holiday. I mean, it works question. both way, guys. It's give and take. That's what friendship is. Plus, you know, they're just in the office doing the PhD work. They can quite easily just leave, surely. Exactly. Because it's flexible, isn't it? Exactly. You're probably less flexible now, so they should I have an actual job now, yeah, so... Yeah, exactly. Come well, on now. They're talking nonsense. <laughs> All right, anyway, let's get your song on. A uh, bit of Christina Aguilera. Please. Yeah, so I chose this song because I was going to choose something about bees and I thought, no, let's be feminists. Let's do a shout out to all the amazing women and girls working in the science, technology, engineering and maths area. And this one's for you. Oh, what a good message. <laughs> well, Beth, I just want to uh, want to thank you for coming in. Thank you very much indeed. We're going to have to get you back. and uh, Definitely. Yeah, you were kind of agreeing to coming back there, actually, off air. But you know, <laughs> if you want to agree on air, then that's proof. I would love to come back. It's been amazing. <laughs> Epic. Well, we, will, we would love to have you, Beth. Thank you very much again to Dr. Bethany Roberts, who joined me last week live on air. Right then, it's come to the end of another show. I know I'm very sad about it. I'm so sorry. I'm going to have to love you and leave you, ladies and gents. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry, but it's true. Left you the playlist, though, so, you know, it could be a lot worse. I picked some right bangers as well, so it's 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 proper awesome playlist. Just you wait. Anyway, I just want to thank all of my very special guests for the day. Thank you very much to Helen Skelton, of course, best known for Blue Peter and Country File, the legendary Helen Skelton. Thank you, Helen. Uh, she spoke alongside David Rennick today. Um, thank you very much indeed to fashion historian Amber Butchart as well, who we had on the show. We She took us back to the 70s, talking about some fashion trends which refuse to go away. Yeah, that's right. They're still around to this day. And, you know, it's pretty amazing they are to be honest because it gave us a great excuse to play some Bee Gees earlier brilliant thanks to professor harold goodwin uh, we spoke to him from the world travel market uh, this evening so thank you for that harold uh, a returning guest as well so that's fantastic another returning guest hugo tagholm the chief executive of the surface against sewage charity thanks for coming on the show hugo talking about those beach cleans you can get involved with those just google Surface Against Sewage, you'll find out where they're doing all of those beach cleans. You can get involved with them locally to you in Cornwall. Thank you very much to the filmmakers behind the film The Elephant Queen. That's Mark Diebel and Victoria Stone. They were telling us about some of the crazy things they <laughs> they had to do to get some of the amazing shots in that film. Like Mark being locked in a metal box, for example, and stalling an aircraft and doing dive dives in an aircraft. Sounds quite terrifying, to be perfectly honest, but I guess that's what you have to do if you want to make an awesome documentary, isn't it? And thank you, of course, to Dr. Bethany Roberts, who we heard from just now. That's me gone. Thank you very much. Join me again next week, Wednesday, 6 o'clock. I'll be there, and I'll be waiting. Right, OK, I'm going to leave you now in the capable hands, in the capable metaphorical hands of this playlist that I've just generated for you. First, though, a very short commercial break. Bye now. Bye. Have a great evening.